Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley. Mark, how are we doing over there? We're good. It's a snowy Monday morning, which uh, I like when it snows here in Chicago, especially during like traffic hour, because it slows down your morning. You know, people aren't getting to the office and blasting off hundreds of emails right away. and kind of slows down uh, that, that, that pace. So I, I do appreciate that. There you go. Way to, way to take that and turn it into a positive. Of course. That's how you got to look at it. What, what, about, uh, what about you? You, you have uh, all these big life changes. You, uh, you exited the W-2. You, you're self-employed now 100%. You're, 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 you're tearing down the house next door, building there. You're, that, that wraps up soon. How's that going? That, that is good. We, we will, by February here, and this will air probably in February, so by the time this airs, we, will be, we, will be, we moved one house over, if that makes sense. We bought, <laughs> bought my neighbor's house and... Um, pretty much made that the way we wanted it to be uh, for enough space because there's six of us. And with COVID, the existing house felt really, really small. And so, yeah, we have, we have a big move. We got to move exactly. I think, you know, I think it's 20 feet door to door. It's, it's <laughs> literally the house right next door, you know, just separated by a gangway. When planning your budget for the rehab, did you say, listen, I, I could spend four more grand on this because I don't have to hire a mover. Like was that uh, part of the conversation at all? <laughs> it was not part of the conversation. It, it's what's been funny with the budget on this is, we actually bought it a long time ago. Um, it, it was just, you know, conversations. We knew her very well. It, finally, when we got under contract, then we leased it back to her because she needed to find her condo. And we didn't know what we were going to do with it. Like, were, were we going to take this our own? Were Chris and I going to flip it? Um, but, but anyways, after, after everything happened, that's when, like, prices went skyrocket. So it was nice that we locked in. But also the supply chain and all the material prices were skyrocket, right? So, like, we were probably, you know, 20 grand off on the original framing or, you know, from two years ago or whenever we started the conversations. Um, so budget's been a funny one on this just because it's been over like a two year timeline of projections and then actuals. And obviously, we, as we all know, like, you know, 2019 or 20 or whenever it was to now, it's like, oh, things are a lot different. So will we have a new uh, straight up Chicago investor studio that you'll have for your background? I, I will. I'm going to have a background like you. Nice. I even bought, I even bought my little, I got a little Jefferson park sign to put up there. Like the, the street sign. I got a, uh, my buddy who is actually in the sign business is making me a, a strip Chicago investor, like logo, like how you have the Chicago flag behind you. Nice. nice. So I'll have that in the background here. I, I got one for Christmas. I have to hang it up yet, but uh, it's pretty cool. I just oh, you got one uh, too. See, yeah. I, I own a, a maintenance company. I love that we're having this conversation and 90% of people are listening to this on, on their headphones. Like guys get to the point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I own a maintenance company uh, as part of the property management, which is almost bigger than our property management, but I, I have to get someone to hang up stuff on my walls. <laughs> so I do, <laughs> there you right? go. So, well, all right. What do we got for the housing provider tip of the week? All right, cool. So this is uh, you yeah, got leasing season coming up here. So, you know, people get themselves in trouble or, or they create more stress around, leasing things out, whether you're a real estate agent, uh, whether you're a real estate firm, or whether you're just doing it yourself. Uh, You know, when it comes to screening, be consistent. consistent. Do the same process every single time. If you want to even get uh, proactive on it, put your screening process out there. So if someone goes to apply, tell them everything that they could expect on it. That way you could stop the same hundred questions. Like, will you accept credits under this? Will you accept dogs? Lay out your screening criteria for for everyone to see in advance, maybe even in, in the listing agreement. Now, also be careful of the laws that you have to make sure that uh, you are following. And we'll put some links to that for Cook County and for Chicago as well too. But when you're when you have your criteria, whether it be credit scores or or pets or uh, your income ratios to rent, make sure those things are all put out there, and that way you'll you'll be able to just go smoother. And then you can never never have anybody say that you're not being fair. But also screen consistently. If you do put those things out there, you do have to follow those as well too. Good stuff. All right, so we got another uh, another referral guest in today. So uh, Roman Vieri over uh, at the NBOA. Thanks for making this introduction. But uh, t- today's guest. A lifelong Chicago native uh, from Lane Tech, Wright College, and Northeastern. Doesn't get much more Chicago than that. Uh, grew up in Avondale, and as we just mentioned, Jeff Park. So we got a lot in common here. Uh, he's done a ton of redevelopments on, on local properties, and then also on, a lot on mixed use, which I know he sent us some of the pictures. It's really cool just taking some of these rundown mixed use buildings um, and, and just the streetscape, the, the, the way they look afterward, just unbelievable. Um, he's In addition to that, he serves in the local chamber of commerce. Uh, lo- it volunteers as part of the steering committee for Avondale Local Neighborhoods Planning Committee. A ton more to talk about. We're going to talk a lot about how just in Chicago specifically, how politics and 
uh, how they play such a big role in what you can actually do as a housing provider and developer. So without further ado, all right, I'm going to try to not butcher this. Nicholas Katsafatos. Katsafatos. I was close. <laughs> close enough. And, and certainly not a, not a bad effort. A for effort. Yeah. So um, I really stumbled through that intro there. And I apologize because the whole time I was just thinking about the last name. <laughs> Like that was one of my that was one of my worst introductions, and I apologize for it because I was just stuck on don't butcher the last name, don't butcher the last name, and still butchered it. So yeah, yeah, no, I, I get it, I get it. Yeah, I used to serve in the Chamber of Commerce, and I currently am uh, on the Avondale uh, CMAP uh, Steering Committee for creating like the neighborhood map. Um, it's you know it, it's it's an intimidating last name. I get it. Don't don't <laughs> hold yourself to too high a bar on that one. Yeah. All right. So so. Let's before we jump into uh, you know a lot of today's discussions gonna be around you know how politics are intertwined here in Chicago. But before getting there, just talk a little about where how did you get started in Chicago real estate investing? What what was day one like? What where do you attract it to? Like just just provide a little bit of context to our listeners here. Sure, sure. So I um I grew up in Chicago, and I knew from an early age that I was very interested in this. I worked in a bookstore in a bread outlet, a few different things while I was going to college. And I read a ton of books on real estate while I was at the bookstore because you have a lot of downtime. And uh, one of the things that I kind of realized is that, you know, growing up in the city, I saw things change. I saw neighborhoods change. And I recognized when I went to Lane Tech, and I don't know all neighborhoods were the same either, because that's a school you have to test into. So I met kids from all over the city that were not from my neighborhood. And, you know, when you're 13, 14 years old, you start getting perspective on where other people are coming from when you're talking to them and they're like, no, I don't have that or this thing over here by my house or et cetera, et cetera. So it was, it was, a, it was, it was a learning experience. And between that, you know, my time in a bookstore reading and kind of like seeing the neighborhoods change, I bought my first condo, which was a map of University Village, uh, a condo on a University Village, like pre, pre-buy pre map, back when it was just like an idea by UIC. And I was like 21, because they were giving away loans like candy at that time. And you just had to fog a mirror to get a loan. All right, so, so you get started. Obviously there's a big jump though from, hey, like yeah, I can buy a condo because it's easy. It's it's 2000, whatever, right, right before the crash. How do you get into redevelopment though, right? Like there's, there's a big jump there from, from condo to all of a sudden we're doing like these massive redevelopments on mixed use properties. True. Um, Well, my first uh, five flat, which was in Bridgeport, which I still own, I hired a general contractor and I paid him and I was his labor so that I could learn about like what went into it. And I discovered that I am terrible at doing that work. I don't have the patience. I don't have the ability. I have a whole new respect for what, for what contractors can do. Because I remember one time I was trying to cut this piece of trim and I had actually measured it out. It was like nine foot, two inches. And I was like, okay, this should work. Cut the trim. I line it up to the wall. I'm short by like an inch and a little bit. And I'm like, what the heck? So then I realized after looking at the wall, but the wall wasn't quite level anymore because it was an old wall. And I should have run the, the tape measure along the wall instead of on the floor. And I, my, I remember I was so aggravated by that. I was so like, my aggravation for that far outweighed what the actual issue was. And I was like, I don't have the patience for this. This is not my job. This is not my future job because that did not line up with the actual seriousness of the circumstance, but I was so pissed at myself. I was like, no, no, this is not for me. I I did something similar, but different. Uh, I thought I could do electricity because my dad was an electrician and ultimately uh, electrocuted one of my partners. (laughs) So uh, I I went the opposite way on on that, but uh, I figured I'm just good at the manual labor piece. But what you brought up there was so interesting. You know, so many people want to learn more. Uh, They want to be part of the process. You literally hired a qualified GC. I mean, he's qualified and you became his free subcontractor, basically. Am I hearing you right? That's awesome. Yeah, but I mean, in the process, I learned a lot and that helped me to better understand what needed to go into like renovation and rehab. And then after that, I bought a building uh, on North Avenue by North and Western over there uh, in East Humboldt Park. And um, it was an old 
funny story. It was an old hardware store, an old hardware store. And that building was like hell when I got in there. I mean, we found an extension cord running on the inside of the wall. I mean, that's how bad it was. And I thought you would appreciate that being an electrician. I was like, how has this guy got a hardware store on the first floor? And the rest (laughs) of the place is like, holy hell, what is going on? And, you know, that was also an experience. But in that situation, we were rehabbing piecemeal because, again, you know, I didn't have the funds. I didn't have the know-how. I didn't have the ability. I didn't have the contacts to basically create what I wanted to right away. And I was still working a corporate day job and I was doing this part time at night and it was a lot of work. But when it was done, I mean, it's it's the most beautiful building on that block, in my opinion. And I love the fact that the streetscape changed because of it. But it took us like a year to restore even the facade in the front. I mean, it was like a legit process, but I love it. And you kind of have to love it because that's how you get through it. Got it. So, so where where are we focused on today? Like, are there specific neighborhoods that that you play in? Are you are you more open than than someone like myself who who kind of pigeonholes himself into certain pockets? Oh uh, well, you know, investing. There's no right or wrong approach. There's just you know whether it's profitable and it works for you, and it or if it doesn't. I, so, you know, that's the nice thing about investing in Chicago is that you can find a lot of different dynamics. I think you'd agree with me on that, right, Tom? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I saw, I found mixed use properties in up and coming neighborhoods to be really, really interesting. I enjoyed them because they allowed me to change the streetscape. They allowed me to like impact the neighborhood's commercial corridor. And also I found that there was a greater value because there was less competition for them because they had different financing requirements, but they weren't so profitable that, you know, I couldn't touch them because, you know, some, private equity portfolio is like buying, you know, a hundred of these. And I just, I just can't get in on that. Um, it was a nice, it was a nice medium. So, so great point, Nicholas. And real quick for our listeners who maybe have not purchased a mixed use, talk about the financing requirements. Like why, what does that look like compared to I'm going to buy a three unit, a four unit, et cetera, like a three unit mixed use versus just a three unit, you know, brick, you know, three flat. Well, I mean, I would say that you'd have to start with a, realizing that you're going to need a capital partner, not just through this one, but you want to probably build a portfolio with a capital partner who's going to understand what you're doing and kind of give you the flexibility you need. But the first thing is, is there's going to be more money on a down payment, right? So you're looking at 25% down, most likely, not 20%, not FHA, but you're looking at 25% down. And then you're looking at a debt to income ratio of at least 1.2. And they want to see that maintained uh, when they're looking at that portfolio, uh, because that cash flow is important for them to justify what hopefully you will be doing next, which is building a line of credit through either cross collateralization or some sort of like system where they leverage your assets to give you an open line that you're not paying for unless you draw on. But that then gives you the ability to move into a property and say, I want to make a bid on this cash. And you take that title and hand it right back to them and say, give me a temporary construction loan or refinancing on this while I spend the money that you've now freed up on my line of credit to go and renovate it. Now you're acting like a professional developer and you have the financial wherewithal to go in there and do that. That is not as hard as you think it is for the average person to obtain. It's essentially building your own business line of credit to go out there and do what you want to do. But it's in real estate, not buying XYZ product and putting it on a shelf. Gotcha. Before we move on to some of the meat of this uh, conversation, I think I, I was talking to somebody recently about mixed use and the facade and, and, and what it'll look like. A lot of people are intimidated by uh, having to find the right vendor to go do a facade and makeover because it's not every general contractor, the normal general contractor that does your rehab on your three or six flat or four flat is not the same guy you'd hire. Any tips or advice for that you give our listeners that might want to rehab a mixed use that they have a facade to actually um, uh, update? Yeah. um, Start with, uh, you know, driving the neighborhoods. And when you do see someone working on a facade, start with walking out there and introducing yourself and talking to that general contractor. This is an amazingly in touch with people, personal people to people business. And I think that some of the best things, the best contacts I've ever made in terms of like construction are being at a site or seeing something and then talking to them and then getting their, their information and having them bid it out because I saw their work already. And because I was able to see their work already, 
on the spot then and there, I was able to you know, make a determination as to whether or not I really even wanted to get a bid from them. And that's, that's a big part of it right there. I, I love that the, the people element that you're saying and the face to face, sometimes you just got to put yourself out there. So far you uh, introverts, you, you got to be a little more aggressive if you want to do stuff like that. And I just want to point out uh, Luke Blahnik, you know, with Avondale bowl and, and the buildings over there that he did at Milwaukee, he, he saw the landlord mess around on the property. He went right up to him and started talking to him. And that's ultimately how he got to put that prop, become a tenant, put the property under contract, ultimately buy it and redevelop to what he's doing today. So that's two examples, almost in the same neighborhood that, uh, mm-hmm. that just people are getting out there and, and just starting conversations that they're not online even. So they're out there in the real world. Yeah. Luke is literally down the street from the two buildings that I just did on Milwaukee, just past central park. Um, and I thought he did a great job with that bowl place. Yeah, it, it's awesome. I know we've plugged it several times, but again, Avondale Bowl, and we can link to it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. So th- this ties in nicely into, you know, you're, you're heavy in Avondale. L- let's talk a little bit about just how politics play a role here. Let's start with the difference between what is a neighborhood versus an actual ward, right? Like, let's get just real baseline here and, and take it from there. Yeah. So in Chicago, we have 50 wards uh, and the wards are, are drawn on the basis of establishing uh, an ethnic majority of white voters, of like Latino voters, of black voters. And that's not necessarily something that uh, I think everyone necessarily agrees with these days, but that is how they draw out the wards. And if you pay attention to local news, you can hear that they're talking about like the Latino map caucus uh, or the Latino caucus map, the people's map, and then the city's uh, map that they put out from the rules committee. So there are competing maps right now and the city votes on it every 10 years after the census. And they have to get at least 41 votes in order for that map to become the new map. And that's kind of like what is going on in Chicago right now. Okay. What, what's the complication there, right? Like why, why should, why should our listeners care? Okay. This is how it's divided, but why, why does that potentially complicate things? Well, so it's important to understand that real estate, if you really want to be successful in real estate, it's important to understand that real estate and your investment formulas are more than just pro formas and like how many units you're buying, but also like what's going on in the neighborhoods that you're buying in. Right. Because the neighborhoods that you're buying in, you have it, you should have as a professional in real estate, an interest in the demographics. And when you're buying mixed use property, that's especially important because there's a commercial aspect to it. And those businesses rely on, you know, feet on the street, rely on uh, commercial traffic. And if you don't have someone that's allowing density to be built, for example, along a major commercial street, that's going to impact you and the value of your real estate. Because if you don't know that, that's going to tie back to you later when you're trying to figure out why your storefront isn't running for X amount of square footage for, you know, X dollars per square foot than uh, the one that you would have thought would have happened just half a mile down the road that way. What's going on over there? Um, You can see this a lot in Chicago, by the way. If you drive around Chicago, you you could see development come up to like a, a street. And then if you haven't noticed, it stops and it stops hard. And then after that, it's like a ghost land. And you're like, oh, this is obvious. I got to invest here. But that's not necessarily always the case. And that's because the wards don't necessarily create neighborhood-based wards. They create wards based off of an ethnic identity, which honestly, I mean, you can read some stuff about that. Even today, if you pick up the local economist, there was an article about how the ward map drawing process in Chicago doesn't necessarily reflect the best way to service the public these days. Is there any, is there anything positive about the way that these are drawn? I mean, when you look at the maps, it, it's, it's, it's a mess. And, and I would think the, the, the term of, uh, how they not uh, salad bowl or, or however the saying is like, it, you're always going to keep this neighborhoods uh, segregated. I, I know we're one of the most segregated uh, based on neighborhood uh, cities out there. Like this only enforces that and, and will prevent it from change. Is there anything positive that comes from this way to shape them? Well, so real estate, if you want to be successful as a study of demographics and guess who else likes demographics and specifically Politics. looks at maps and dem- politicians. That's right. They love demographics. So you have to be at least as savvy as they are to understand what's going on. 
Um, I don't think that there's a lot of value. And I'm going to cite that Economist article right now as an example of that, because right now, if you talk to a, a, you know, a white person, an Asian person, a Latino person, a black person, a lot of them have the same concerns at the really local level. And that is what? Education, crime, you know, neighborhood features, transportation, a lot of the same concerns we all have living in the city of Chicago. And we've had a lot of progress in the 50 years since we passed that that law and that inability to acknowledge progress uh is something that's kind of a challenge i mean even bill maher made a joke about it it's like we 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 cannot seem to acknowledge progress at all um and that fundamentally allows the continued system to occur without any questioning and it's important because if you don't question that system and the way it works it just keeps reinforcing itself and it doesn't necessarily benefit people who like take an interest in, put a stake down in the communities that they want to invest in locally. It's just so messed up when you look at our ward map like, and how it runs, like the, like it, you literally almost have certain wards looping around other wards. I don't know. I was just throwing my comment there. Um, but uh, you know, you look at other big cities like Los Angeles, stuff like that. It, it's not perfect squares like a township might be, but it does, it, you know, it might be a, an awkward oval, like, and it's still like kind of all connects and uh, uh, touching each other. Well, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you an example. My my first my first example, I think, which is probably the strongest example I have over here, because I'm I've invested in areas that are on the edge and coming up, and I've observed it for a long time. So if you go down to Wicker Park and you go down Division Street, you know everything looks great. There's a lot of investment. You see active businesses thriving, a lot of new housing. Uh, there's a lot of commercial activity, but then you hit the hospital. And as soon as you hit Western, then it stops. Now that's because Maldonado's ward, the 26th ward, then proceeds to take hold. And one of the things that Maldonado did was he just straight up down zoned everything, which brings us to zoning. Zoning is the power that these aldermen have that a lot of people don't even really realize, they don't even know what that is. But what that is, is the ability for businesses to open and for density to be built. And fundamentally, they control that because they have something called Alderman prerogative. And maybe you have heard of that, and maybe you don't know necessarily what that is as a layperson, but as a real estate professional, you need to be cognizant of that because that's gonna impact your ability to either do business or see the kind of things that happen in your neighborhood that are gonna be built and may or may not impact the business side of your commercial investment, right? And so Nick, can we dig in real quick? Like, what power does the alderman have like in the zoning process of, hey, I wanna tear this down and build X or I wanna redevelop whatever. What, what role does that alderman play? So the alderman ultimately has the final say in whether or not you're gonna be able to get the, the approval essentially to build the number of units you want or to fundamentally like open up a business over here because the zoning is gonna be, that zoning decision that he has is gonna be backed up by his peers at the city level. And that means that regardless of what, how you feel or how anybody else feels, that's gonna happen based off of one man's decision or one person's decision. That's how the key is gonna turn. And there are 50 different processes. So even if you are a real student of one particular ward, there's 50 freaking wards and every ward does it differently. And it's very Byzantine and it's intentional. So that kind of like process has a bunch of people from like one extreme side completely, hey, do they like you? Do they like what's going on? I'm going to support it. That's that. To really active communities that have these uh, what I call community driven zoning processes or what they call community driven zoning processes. But oftentimes they're smoke screens. The, the, that process is set up to manufacture an output that the alderman wants. I mean, I ask you, do you think that they're ever going to have a decision made that they don't support and are vehemently against that they're going to go ahead and say yes to? I mean, I'm just asking you the obvious, <laughs> but probably not. So you're kind of in a kangaroo court in some of those wards. Um, and those are the wards that I primarily operate in, which are the DSA wards, Democratic Socialist of America, where any kind of uh, any kind of development faces a heavy, heavy scrutiny and gets a burden that uh, probably is a little bit more disproportionate to be lifted than, say, the rest of the city. 
Got it. How, can you give us some examples? I know you shared some facts with us, just how, you know, in some words it's taking, you know, double or triple the amount of, of lead time and the denials are, you know, up X percent. Like just yeah. throw some of those facts out here for our listeners so they can see like, wow, this really does affect development. Even if I have a three unit, I care about everything else being developed around it, right? That's going to affect my pricing. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, if you were to, let's say buy a, a three flat or a four unit building, especially if it's on a street where you have a storefront on the first floor, you're going to want to know that, you know, development can come here both in terms of like building density and the businesses that open up here. So let's start out with something that one of your previous guests, Steve Vance, he was talking about Chicago cityscape and the, uh, you know, how it was like a data aggregator, right? Well, if you go on to cityscape, you can look up an alderman's average time to pass zoning changes, you know, zoning ordinance changes. I, I operate in the 35th ward right now. And I can tell you that Rosa's average time to pass Carlos Ramirez Rosa his average time to pass versus the city's average. The city's average is, I believe, 79 days, I want to say. Ask me how many days Rosa is averaging. If you're saying 79, I'll guess 200, 300, some, some crazy higher. <laughs> no, not quite that bad, but 166. So that's 166 days. That's, that's very nearly half a year for you to get an answer on something that you're holding your whole project up for. So that's additional holding costs, that's an uncertainty, and that's a very long drawn out process. If you're an investor or if you're somebody who wants to see your neighborhood change, do you think that that bodes well for you? Yeah, that's a, it's a huge hindrance, right? Like it's, it's yeah. all, all the day, not only is it a huge hindrance on the holding costs, but all those bigger developments that don't come, that don't bring the people, that's the part that kills you, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and fundamentally, he would probably tell you if I was to guess his answer, well, that's because we have a driven community driven zoning process where the people get to give input and it takes time to get to mock. No, no. His process, because he's he owns it. He's been alderman now for two terms because he's the longest serving DSA alderman. He owns that last statistic I just gave you. That's not it's for the last five years because he's been alderman for that entire time. It's a part of that kangaroo court process where fundamentally there's no set way to actually determine a vote. Like there, it's funny to me because you look at the national level and we're talking about voting rights right now. But if you look at it locally, there is a very, very, let's call it malleable process to get any outcome you want. You need a geography, right? Anybody can get way in over there. I've seen it. I've been a part of it. You go in to weigh in on something, I could put down any address I want. I could be a Martian from Mars and put down an address that I want. And, you know, that'll be that'll be considered because that'll be input given. Um, there's no verification of the person giving that 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 vote. So, you know, like you and I, we can't go vote in some other precinct or ward. We have to have, you know, some ability to be identified in that. No, nope, not with him. That's not how that works. I mean, I can just be anybody from anywhere and not have to show ID and hey, my vote counts. The operation, I mean, if it's something they really, really want to protest, you're going to have people in there that are disruptive as heck, right? Like it's, it's not at all organized in any way, shape or form. And then actually holding the vote and counting it there. Well, yeah, that'll happen there, but they'll take votes in their office for two weeks afterwards. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to land on whatever I want it to land on. If I see the vote count going one way or the other, and I need to come up some people to make sure it votes the way I want it to. This is not really a, a, a democratic process. It's kind of a sham. And that's just one alderman. I don't want to just hold up Rosa as an example there. You can have like a non-DSA, like, a, do you remember a music venue that was going to go in on Pulaski? Does anyone here remember a music venue that was going to go in on Pulaski by like Brightwood and Pulaski? Anybody? I do. don't remember, but continue on. Yeah, that's, that's another factor is like, you know, no one remembers the projects that don't get built, but I do. And that was going to be a great music venue right on Pulaski by Wrightwood. And Felix Cardona was the alderman. And he actually did everything I just suggested. He had like boundaries, time frame, operation, everything. It was highly contested by Logan Square Neighborhood Association, which is a closed multi-million dollar neighborhood group. I wouldn't even call it a neighborhood group. It's an umbrella group that you have to be invited into. And fundamentally, they opposed it. For a lot of reasons, they claim gentrification, they claim the investment driving out local people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the vote happens 
And guess what? It's in favor. It's in favor. Suddenly Cardona has an epiphany. You know what? We're going to give it two weeks at my office. And then two weeks later, it comes back. It's against. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing. Vote night, the voting stops, the tally stops, votes happen. People can and cannot show up at any time and point. Fundamentally, it's a way to justify having a community stamp while enacting the will that you were going to anyway. And this kind of thing has an impact. You know what's going on over in that space right now? Nothing. I think the farmer's market's over there right now because it's cold. But generally speaking, that space hasn't developed into anything. So we have two years later, nothing to show for it. Yeah. So, so it, what's funny is I'm actually, this week I'm walking a building right by the park there, just north of there. Okay. <laughs> it's, like, it's funny that you brought up something exactly where, where I'm looking. So as an investor now, the, this all makes sense. What, what do I do, right? Like, how do I get involved? Like, how do I work towards or work uh, against some of these headwinds? Well, I think the first thing is, is that fundamentally uh, we are pretty in tune with the neighborhood, right? Development has, has, they've spent a lot of time villainizing us and, you know, people in the real estate industry need to recognize that because it is something that, you know, they've spent a lot of time and money doing and the local press, unless you engage with them or unless you speak with them to the point of data, they're not going to necessarily always consider you because you're I've noticed a lot of business people don't want to have an opinion or an impact because they don't want to get involved. But that absence allows for this thing to continue on that way. By not addressing this issue, they empower the issue to continue on because that means that it doesn't get highlighted. It doesn't get talked about. And you have to join neighborhood groups. You have to join your chambers of commerce. You have to start there because those are the first blocks in a political power structure that allow you to have a voice from the community into like the local conversation that gets covered by local news. Got it. So that's step one, joining the chamber of commerce. There's a lot of different other organizations out there at at the end of the day though, like what it it gives me a voice, but then like, let's say I'm going to go, I'm going to go develop something and I want to make it a six unit. It's zoned where I can only do three. You know, mm-hmm. what are some other things that I can do to, to, to help further my cause if I truly believe it's going to be good for the neighborhood? Like, are there zoning attorneys that have ins with these aldermen? Like, this is Chicago. Like, there's always, there's always a way, and then there's a Chicago way. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what you're talking about was the old school process where we would have people that would be connected and they would be able to have prior conversations and be able to get uh, the, uh, let's just say, not public opinion of the decision maker up front so that you could act with some level of certainty. I think that that's actually kind of gone the way of the dodo. That especially happens now more so than ever because we have a lot of situations where you will go into an office, you'll talk to the alderman, they'll seem particularly supportive. And I'm, I can think of one example, for example, there was a project that happened right down the street from me at 2901 North Milwaukee. It was a proposed 19 unit building in a TOD area on a corner, very, very in line with what's over there. It would have brought 19 units for affordable 15 market rate. That would have, that would have hit 20% for the ARO. It would have been in line with the area over there. A lot of things to like about that project, right? Talks to the alderman. The alderman's like, yeah, I'm in favor of density. A half a year later, (laughs) this poor son of a bitch, Oh, sorry. can't say that. This poor guy, he's, he's still waiting on an answer. And he's trying to basically build some affordable housing units and 15 market rate units, which are going to put people on the street that are going to be sales for the local businesses. And in that stretch of Milwaukee, there's a ton of dark storefronts. But he's, he's meeting opposition. And he's meeting opposition because there's no way for that, for that initial Uh, conversation of his, he had no way of understanding what would have actually have occurred. I would say if I was him, the first thing that I would have done before doing all that was do things on contingent. He bought that property before uh, putting in like a zoning contingency. So he was already committed 
And that was step number one that I probably wouldn't have done if I had been him. I would have had a zoning contingency in there because uh, I, I wouldn't commit dollars before I have some ideas to just, you know, how long or how much I can actually, you know, invest into this particular project. So that's number one. Uh, number two would be that, you know, I would want a really clear line, lined out description of the process from the alderman or from his chief of staff. Uh, so that I understand exactly what I have to do. That particular case, he had actually put flyers out to build support for his project. And then he got nailed from the alderman who attacked him for using flyers that were similar looking to his flyers. And really it was just an attempt to like smear the guy because Rosa's anti-market rate housing. I mean, bluntly, he would rather have less market rate units than affordable units, even though he claims he's affordable housing driven because it's about managing his demographic. And you have to understand the mindset of the alderman, right? If they view you as displacing their voting demographic, they're not gonna be very friendly disposed to you in any way, shape or form. They've just worked on, fought for a war with boundary lines that have a demographic that they wanna see. You're gonna come in and potentially change that? They're not on board with that. And it's counterintuitive to assume that they would be. Yeah. So a couple things there. One, going back to the zoning contingency, we had a great episode, episode 109 with uh, Matt Katsaros, another name I'm going to butcher here, but he <laughs> talked about how he buys the developments. You pay a premium for, for that zoning contingency. It's the opposite of the cash deal, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of closing quick at a discount, I'll pay a little more to cover myself and protect myself. Mm -hmm. So just a quick shout out there. All right. So let's play devil's advocate though, to some of these, some of these things, because it, this isn't just, yes, there's politics involved, but there is gentrification is a scary word, right? And mm -hmm. there are people who will get placed out, like plain devil's advocate, you know, there, there's definitely validity there. How do you balance that, right? How do you balance that a development coming in and it might raise prices, right? It might, it's going to raise rents if it does its job and that could hurt people in the community. Well, that's a fair question. And I, and I think it's one that actually you know, requires a fair and thoughtful answer. So let me start with this. Um, fundamentally, the argument of displacement, I mean, things will improve. And yes, sometimes rents will push some people out. But let's talk about that. How much of a push are we talking about here? Like how many people are being displaced? You know, Lance Friedman uh, is a fellow at uh, the Brookings Institute. Um, he was an urban planner at Columbia University. Uh, he did a study on displacement. Um, if you look at uh, uh, Ingrid Gold Ellen, uh, NYU professor of urban policy and planning, uh, she did a study on displacement. Um, there was a, the Philly Fed did a study on displacement. And these are all within the last, let's say five years. Okay, so I'm using reasonably recent data. And I really like Ingrid, Ingrid uh, Gold Ellen's uh, uh, study because they followed kids on Medicaid. Okay, so these kids were tracked because they were on Medicaid. They were disadvantaged from, a de from an economics perspective in gentrifying neighborhoods versus non-gentrifying neighborhoods in New York. And you know what she found? Even in the most highly gentrified neighborhoods, there was only a migration pattern increase of about maybe 4% versus say non-gentrifying neighborhoods. And in gentrifying neighborhoods that were coming up, but not like super, super red hot, two to 3%. You know what? That's a lot lower than even, I, I was surprised by that because I didn't even know what to expect when I was looking into this. It is a factor, but it's a factor that gets blown up for political reasons. And it is not so out of control that they can't focus on helping people who need that help. They should be focusing on people that need that help. But to economically hurt people that have invested in their neighborhood in order to maintain a ethnic identity that doesn't necessarily serve anybody but themselves in terms of being reelected, I don't think that that's necessarily moral either. Think about all of the Puerto Rican landlords that own in little Puerto Rico there along division. The cost of their real estate is substantially lower than the cost of real estate on the other side of Western. Why is that? Those people took a risk. They invested in their neighborhood. So did a lot of people who bought their homes over there. But fundamentally, you have damaged their ability to provide for their families, to be able to provide for their futures, because why? 
because you think that a two or three percent increase in migration for people who have less than they might otherwise have had are fundamentally more important. Well, I understand how it plays publicly. I totally get that. Um, and it sounds great. Certainly a good narrative. But that doesn't necessarily do the moral thing, which is help people who have tried to help themselves and fundamentally try to develop programs that target the people who can't help themselves. That to me is moral. That to me is helpful. And that to me is a much more dynamic and diverse city that's growing, that's healthy than somebody who's trying to artificially maintain groups of people in little invisible lines that don't necessarily make sense to anybody but them. That's a powerful answer, man. We're gonna have to go back. We're gonna go back and re-listen to that one. That was that was well thought out with uh with some facts there. So very good. I, if I'm listening to this, I go back and rewind that last two minutes there. Thank you. All all good conversation, and I think uh, I think what gets overlooked a lot when it comes to the term gentrification is these things are happening. Whether you limit this one or two. Uh, development or don't allow a, another building to be built. No matter what, it's still happening. I mean, Logan is a perfect example. It happened all around, no matter how much they would have capped those things. It's still going up and, and making things unaffordable. It's things are unaffordable over there in the uh, affordability scales. So, you know what would help there? Uh, there was a study in, by a Cornell graduate in for, um, and the name escapes me right at the moment, uh, but. For every 100 units of market rate housing they built, rents dropped about 1%. That situation, you should be building more. And then you create more affordability. You create the filtering effect that winds up getting older housing to go a little cheaper because it's running in comparison to new housing. Now you're improving the, the actual quality of life for people who are paying market rate housing. And fundamentally, when you talk to people from LA or from New York, the first thing you're going to hear people say is, I get so much for my money moving here. It's the first thing they say when they talk about moving to Chicago. Ask anybody who is renting in New York or LA about their rental experience compared to here, and that will be the very first thing they say. Look at, uh, I mean, we went through it the last couple of years, West Loop, South Loop, the oversupply with all the new builds, uh, thousands of new units came to the market and it dropped rents. First time I've ever seen it happen in, in, uh, in areas we've worked in, but it dropped rents 10, 15% some places. And that, uh, Supply will uh, will uh, will do that. Yeah, and for some reason, a supply and demand is an imaginary thing in housing, but in every other respect, it matters. And you see it in the supply chain right now, right? Try to buy something, you go to a shelf, a store somewhere, it's either not there, you got to go to a second place. Supply and demand exists, but for some reason, in housing, people seem to think, and I, and again, I I attribute this to the politics that go on outside of our investment decisions they think that it doesn't exist and that it's some sort of like evil malicious force that's 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 just trying to oppress or deprive them of things and that's not at all the case but you can't have that conversation with somebody who won't have a, a let's say a dispassionate disposition towards it right like people will get really passionate about their neighborhood sometimes and i understand i love my neighborhood i totally get it but you have to unwind a lot to have one thoughtful conversation with one person, where it's really easy to get people amped up and get them aggressive about stuff uh, because it's just human nature. That's a lot easier to do. It's awesome. I love, uh, I love these episodes that we kind of highlight some of the uh, headwinds that uh, we're up against and, and things we have to make sure we're taking account when we're trying to look at the goals we're trying to set for ourselves here in Chicago. So with all that said, though, what, what's your outlook? I mean, you're here investing. Um, you, you, you've learned your ways to work through and around uh, these. You're, you're obviously trying to uh, petition for change. What's your outlook on Chicago? Uh, you right. know, I'm very optimistic about Chicago because I think uh, Chicago has a lot of geographically very desirable things uh, to look to look at versus, say, uh, some other cities. But uh, fundamentally, I think that we have Chicagoans need to start becoming less apathetic towards the the both the political process and their neighborhoods. One of the things I've discovered in talking to like neighborhood organizations and, and looking at various, you know, participants and players here, a lot of them are the same people. There's a lot of apathy uh, in neighborhoods and a lot of like, n n just, I don't know. Like, I don't know, I don't know. You know, and we need to get more community involvement going on at the local levels 
to get people more aware of like how things work and, you know, more understanding behind why things change in their neighborhood the way they do or they don't, you know, NIMBYism is a real thing. We deal with it all the time, right? You know, if you want to, if you want to get a change, you know, you'll naturally have a lot of NIMBYists come out, but there's a, there's a YIMBY movement that's kind of like developing out there. We should be supportive of that. Um, and that YIMBY movement is one where they recognize that a dynamic city grows and changes and investment occurs and that you need processes in place that are going to be at least even handed or fair about determining whether or not that's going to happen in your neighborhood. I think aldermanic prerogative uh, is something that at least has been talked about now a little bit by the current mayor, although not nearly enough. She never followed through on it for her first term. And I'm not going to lie. I was really disappointed on that, that, that prerogative and the way we determine our boards really injures Chicago. Uh, I can work around it. Uh, and I think others have found ways to work around it too, but it needs to change for Chicago to get to the next level. And the next level is we have wards based on shared identity, right? So what's going on in your neighborhood? Do you use the same parks as I do? Do we use the same schools? Do we have the same transit issues? Do we have the same safety issues? These are the things that determine a neighborhood. If you and I go to the same park, but we live on opposite sides, we're probably living the same city life experience. That's a neighborhood, not, hey, I'm in neighborhood 33, the 33rd ward, but across the street is the 35th ward because there's some cluster of housing there that that particular alderman wants, but there's one particular development over here that the alderman doesn't want because there's a lot of nimbyism against him. He can let it go anyway. Stuff like that, that doesn't serve us. That serves them. It serves their ability to stay in power and continue to make decisions that aren't necessarily good for the city, but good for them. I think we have to recognize that and be a little bit more vocal. Developers need to be more vocal and view themselves as part of the community, not, not like an app, like some third party outside of the community. We can't be like that. We have to be part of it. Love it. Love it. Love that answer. Tom, anything else or we'll wrap? Let's wrap it. All right. All right. You're clearly uh, a successful person in the community, in your real estate portfolio, you continue to grow. How have you, what's your competitive advantage? How have you been able to do it? You got to know the zoning and you got to know what you can use with that zoning. And then you figure out ways to purchase things and build it to the audience that you're going to be having in that area. So knowing your audience and that area, and I would say doubling down in that area. So when you develop, find an area that's being underutilized, heck, <laughs> In my situation, I use the 35th Ward anti-development stance. It's an advantage to me. Do you know why? It scares away my competitors. It scares away my competitors. I can continue to buy up in an area that other people are not. I can redevelop it. I know the audience that I'm playing to, and then I redevelop it, and then it happens, and it changes whether they want it to or not. But now I've done it, and I go on to the next one. So you got to find ways to, you know, jujitsu it <laughs> into a circumstance that works for you um, and knowing the zoning, knowing the community, knowing the process and knowing what you can do on your own and then being able to cater to the people that will like that. That's all key. So if you're talking about how to navigate the community, I'd say that that's a big part of it. And then you have to be active. Like I said, join your community groups, join, join the chambers of commerce. Don't be quiet demand some change and you're going to get pushback because they capture the first thing they do is they capture the decision-making bodies of those organizations to get a stamp of approval from them. That's, that's a big part of it. They don't want to make a decision in an absence or in a void. They want that community group stamp. But if you insert yourself, you can at the minimum, at the minimum, start changing the dialogue and the conversation and you have to bring your friends, get your friends to join. Get, get people who are like-minded to join because that is the only way you start changing things. Love it. That was, that was a lot of advice. What is one piece of advice you would tell someone that has yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Um, have your long-term plan in place and reverse engineer it back to the first day you start. Meaning like when you buy this condo, when you buy this first piece of property, how do you see it rolling up to the larger picture when you're where you want to be. So start where you want to ultimately be in your mind and then reverse engineer your way down so that you can develop a plan and every step up is going towards that goal that you already had 
further up there. And that thought process is there for you so that when you're doing something in the present, you know how it relates and how it goes back up to that ultimate, you know, that ultimate goal. You don't have to even build these ideas yourself anymore. I'm not suggesting that, but back when I was doing this, when I first started, I did not have Facebook to connect me to people that might already be in the business or that might be willing to share their knowledge. The ability to get knowledge is so much easier these days because of technology and the willingness of people to share their knowledge. You can do that. So once you have your plan, reverse engineer it backwards, you can get the resources you need to ask those questions and not make the same mistakes they had to make. Love it. Love it. It's one of uh, Stephen Covey's seven habits, beginning with the end in mind. Yeah. All right. Nicholas, what do you do for fun? Uh, well, I, I do go to the gym uh, pretty regularly. I'm a, I'm a big believer in health and fitness. Uh, I like to read a lot. Um, I do some volunteer work, uh, when I can, and, uh, I have an aging parent that I kind of have to focus on right now. That's not fun, but I love her. So that counts. That's cool. You mentioned you read a lot. What's a good book, podcast, or self-development activity that you would recommend to our listeners? Um, I would say that you could read Robert Green. looking just up here at my, at my library right in front of me. I'd say Robert Greene, uh, he has several books out, but The Laws of Power are phenomenal if you're a student of history. Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, phenomenal book. Um, if you were to read Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, I think that's a phenomenal book. The Tipping Point, I'm just looking again at the uh, books on my shelf right here. The Tipping Point, that's another real good book by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, a lot of these books, you're gonna find what I call similar veins of thinking. And those similar veins of thinking start to kind of form a larger picture for you. Uh, every time you read that book, you see, oh, that ties into this or that kind of ties into that. And these thought processes then start to become second nature to you. And eventually you start to absorb them. All of the uh, Malcolm Gladwell books are awesome. Um, and along the same lines of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. All right. Besides yourself, name one person in your local network you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Um, well, let's see here. Uh, signs myself. Now, what, when you say like a, a one other investor, is it somebody that does the same thing I do or is it not to overly read into that conversation, but just somebody that's in real estate or related to real estate? Just contractor, closing company, attorney, lender. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Anyone in the ecosystem. Anyone in the ecosystem. All right. Um, there is one attorney that I, that I particularly love. Um, I'm trying to remember uh, her last name. So bear with me one second while I find that, but uh, she is a CPA and she is a um, Christine Duffy Duffy. How can you forget Duffy? Uh, Christine Duffy. She's an attorney and a CPA, a real estate attorney and a CPA. She has got uh, the skills to do like a 1031 exchange. Like you wouldn't believe. Um, because she is a CPA and she is a real estate driven attorney, she has a lot of really good insight into the process. And I would say that she's somebody that you could utilize for uh, not just your real estate transaction, but also for like future tax purposes. Great. Nicholas, you have provided a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? And is there any way they can provide value to you? Um, just just get out there and, and be more involved. I mean, you know, if you're a broker, if you're a developer, if you want to be an investor, start by learning about the communities you want to invest in. Um, you know, start destigmatizing what has been a real big push by some of the people in the city to like villainize our profession and what we do. We are investing in our communities. If you're a local Chicago and investing in Chicago, you're betting on the city of Chicago. You're buying a piece of its municipal debt when you essentially buy a house. You just bought a house. What you just bought was a piece of the municipal debt. And that is highly terrifying when I say it like that, but it is true. Uh, you can't walk away from it like anybody else. Somebody signs a lease, they're here for 12 months, they can leave tomorrow, the day after that lease. You, you are tied to it, my friend, in a way that you are not. So you need to get involved because if you're not involved, other people are going to get involved and they have agendas that are not necessarily in line with what would be good for you or the new faith investment that you put into the city. Love it. Good stuff here. All right. So Mark, let's see if we can get this one here. So for our trivia, 
we mentioned there's 50 wards and there's 50. So there's 50 aldermen's one per ward, mm-hmm. which side note's kind of crazy because New York has 51 and they're like four times the size of us. LA only has 15. But even crazier, this was established in 1923. Before that, we had 35 wards represented by how many aldermen's? And the answer is not 35. So, Mark, I'll give you first shot at it. Uh, it's not multiple choice. <laughs> oh, sure. I'll make it multiple choice for you. I just said it's not 35. So I'll give you, I'll give you 40, 65, 75, or 90. I would say 40. Nicholas? Uh, I would actually tend to agree with that statement. 40. Nah, 70. Two per ward. Oh. Are you serious? Wow. So there was two per ward. So wow. it was even more messed up in uh, 1889. Nice. That's insane. That's like, that's, that's, that's oh, wow. Well, I guess, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, we have made progress. See, I'm going to acknowledge progress. That's yeah. progress. <laughs> that's progress. That's progress. Let's see if we can make some more progress going forward. Nicholas, thanks for coming on, Tom. Thanks as always. Listeners, please leave us a review and uh, also check out our Facebook uh, page, Straight Up Chicago Investor Club. We love to, uh, if you have any questions, needs, resources you want to share, please provide on there. Maybe even just general questions about a lease that you're signing. Feel free to go on there. And there's plenty. There's over 600 other people that will uh, help you with whatever you're trying to accomplish. It was like 900, man. We're growing. 900. Okay. I, I know for sure we're over 600 and I wasn't sure. So I didn't want to overshoot. You got to get on there. Tactic. So it shows Mark's not providing a lot of value. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas, thanks, man. Tom, thanks. Everyone else, we'll see you next week.